Hey everyone, hope everyone's having a great config so far. Uh, I'm Darren from Figma and I'll be your MC for today. Uh, next up we have Bonnie Kate. Bonnie is a senior brand designer at OpenTable and she's also a freelance illustrator and icon, icon designer. Uh, please round of applause for Bonnie. Hi everyone. Let's get started. So I'm going to probably zip a little faster through it just so we can see everything. Um, but today I'm talking about creating illustration systems that work for everyone. And what you're going to see uh, today is who I am. Um, we're going to talk about the landscape of illustration. Then we're going to do an illustration activity, which is kind of what you guys have started with a little bit, where you're getting to play and draw and change things. Um, and then uh, while you're still playing with the tool, you'll be able to hear about the first steps towards building a great illustration library. And then if we have time, open discussion. We kind of started with some open discussion, uh, which I liked. Uh, it was spontaneous. Um, and feel free to ask questions during. If you have a question, raise your hand. Darren has the mic, and he will be able to get it to you. So I, I would love to answer questions when I'm on the relevant slide, so do not hesitate. All right, this is who I am. I am Bonnie Kate Wolf, and I am a senior brand designer at OpenTable. Before that, I was at Square and SurveyMonkey and Lush Cosmetics. Uh, I have a bachelor's in illustration and a master's in graphic design, and I got both of those while I was living in London for five years. I'm going to jump back for some nostalgia. Yeah, nostalgia gets a woo. Um, back in 2004, when I was like 12, um, this is what I was doing. So I was making little pixel people, and then I was working with other artists to create these collaborative drawings of the pixel people. Uh, so you would have one artist who would make the like person, and they'd have many poses, and then you would draw the like hair and the face and the body and or like the, the clothes, and then we'd all come together and make these drawings. And that's what I did for many years, all this pixel art. And that translates pretty directly into now what I do today, actually, which is a lot of drawing, a lot of iconography, typography. Um, so it's kind of come full circle, like. 15 years later. So this is a sample of the things that I do, which is a lot of drawing, which is my favorite thing to do. Let's talk about the landscape of illustration. So when I say illustration, that means a lot of things. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So what we're not talking today are personal styles. So uh, let's say Caviar hires Alex Norris. Yep, right there in the middle, those happy little guys uh, with a pile of meat. Um, they hire Alex Norris to perhaps design an email campaign like this one, which was for vegetarianism. Um, Alex Norris produces something awesome, they use it for the email, then they're done with Alex Norris for that campaign. Today, we're not talking about getting an amazing illustrator like one of these fine folks on the board. Um, we're talking about what happens when a company needs a house style. So not the style of that illustrator, but a house style. So a house style is going to be something developed specifically for that company. So Slack is my, one of my favorite examples. So Alice Lee, who is incredibly talented, designed a whole illustration system for Slack. And it's related to her style, but it was developed very specifically for Slack. And now I think we have some Slack folks in the room. So I hope that I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking accurately. Um, but now they get to use that, and it's specifically made for them. So in the same way that all of these styles, I'm sure you recognize some of them as being that house style of that um, brand, especially something like Airbnb. That's fairly new. Um, and I'm sure you've seen it if you've used the app or gone to their website. But what happens when individual illustrators move on to their next project? So Alice Lee is going to go do something else, and she's not going to be working for Slack anymore. And she may have been a contractor, or whoever it is may have been a full-time person. But what happens when they leave? What do you as product designers or brand designers, any other kind of designer, do? Internal brand and product teams need to be able to create and update illustrations. I'm sure everyone has had a pain point where you need to update something, but you don't know how it was made, or you don't know where the file is, or you only have a flat file, or any number of horrible things that have happened. And the illustrator isn't available. Maybe they're too expensive. Maybe they don't work anymore because they won the lottery. Um, so we need to be able to update these illustrations. Um, I thought it would be wise to mention this article, which was written by Rachel Hawley um, for Ion Design, which was titled, Don't worry, these gangly armed cartoons are here to protect you from big tech. It's quite a good title. It's quite a good title. Um, and in the article, she talks a lot about Facebook and the style that was developed for Facebook and how that kind of permeated the landscape of illustration and tech. And there's some good that comes from that because we're starting to show people in products, which is exciting. Um, but there's some kind of systematization that happens once you get a really big company making a very popular illustration style. It's very trendy. Um, so in order to combat that, I would like to make the argument that the homogenization of illustration in tech isn't due to systematization. Um, 
the way that we create aesthetic authenticity, say that five times fast, um, happens when design leaders take risks. So that means at the very beginning, the people at the top are making sure that you're taking bold, you're making bold choices. And then secondarily, design teams are set up to successfully replicate and execute in a house style. And that's gonna be different by company. It might be that you, need, you know that you have an illustrator, you're always gonna work with them, and you're gonna have a system set up to do that, or maybe you don't have an illustrator and you need to be able to do it in-house with a product designer or a brand designer. My hypothesis, a fun multi-syllable word, um, is to empower designers to create compelling illustrations, brands need to make authentic choices and build robust systems. So the authentic choices part is pretty subjective. Like how do you decide what is a good drawing, a good style, what is on brand, what is off brand? So we're not gonna talk about that so much today because that could be a three hour talk. Um, we are gonna talk about building robust systems. As a note, uh, when we talk about systematizing, a lot of people think making universal illustrations. Um, and I would argue that universal illustrations, so something that represents theoretically everybody, doesn't actually include anyone, um, even though it doesn't exclude anyone. I said in the opposite of the way it's written up there. Um, so when we talk about diversity, which is a lot of uh, the time comes up when we're talking about drawing people, sometimes the solution is, well, we're gonna make a bunch of different people in a bunch of different colors. And those colors are often not the colors of human skin. Um, like a blue person does not all automatically represent a person of color. Um, and doing illustrations of different color people also does not actually represent diversity because diversity is far more than race. It's age, it's culture, it's gender, sexual orientation, so many other things. So. When I say diversity and you've got the quotes around it, like yes, an illustration like that is technically diverse. Those people are all different. However, it doesn't create a sense of belonging and belonging is what diversity is supposed to create. It's to make you feel like you are represented, your friend is represented, you're seeing people who are like you and the people in your community. So when we work to create diverse illustrations, we need to be thinking about more than just making people different from each other and more about representing the people in the room, the people who use your app, the people who go to your website, and the people in the world. This is a case study from Airbnb uh, that Jennifer Hom wrote up on their design blog. Um, and this talks a little bit about, it's a great article and you should read it, um, but uh, it talks about how they developed the uh, illustration system and how they looked at real human faces and then from there explored what are the commonalities so that you don't have to draw a brand new type of nose every single time, but what kinds of noses are there? Because they're not really limitless. We can't draw billions of noses, but we can draw more than one nose. Um, so this is how she kind of explored from starting to draw people to examining it to then actually creating these individual noses. And then that's how you create a beautiful, in my opinion, brand illustration um, that has parts of diversity that most people don't even consider, like the woman with the um, artificial limb, it doesn't even, you don't really notice it at first because it's, they're not trying to make you go, ooh, look how diverse we are. It's just part of this system to be diverse and to be representative. So this is Paper Dolls, which you got to look at a little bit before. This is something I built for Square. Um, so it started with the stuff on the left and it came from a need to illustrate Square's merchants and the merchant's customers. And we didn't really have a way to show people and we just had photography, but photography, is great, especially if you're in America and taking photos of American things, but what happens when you need to say, use that same photograph in Japan? In Japan, the culture is very different, and that even, for instance, at Square, the hardware is different, so we can't even use the same photograph because the hardware is wrong. Um, but we're not gonna necessarily spend thousands of dollars going to Japan and shooting the exact same thing, but with illustration, it's very easy to examine the culture, find the commonalities that you want to keep, find the differences, and then ex uh, appreciate and express that culture and work with your designers in Japan to do that, um, as one example. And so these little uh, full-bodied people on the left then eventually developed into this larger system, which you don't have in your uh, file, of faces because we were showing like the same person over and over again because we don't have time. It's, it takes a lot of time to draw faces. and. It's, it seems like a lot of work, especially if you're not an illustrator, or if you're an illustrator, if you have one, which was like me, like happens to go on holiday, what do you do? Um, even if I'm out for a week and you have to ship something. So with this tool, you can see how many components there are. It's not very many, but we're able to make, and this is just a small portion, a whole bunch of people. And so this is then how that got integrated into an actual uh, illustration that we used in a presentation about Square Dashboard. 
All right, let's get on to the illustration activity. How am I doing on time? I realize I can check my time. Oh, we're doing great, gang. Okay. So, paper dolls. So, uh, if you want to jump into the paper dolls file, you have it. Um, and I explained this a little bit before. And if I go too quickly, just raise your hand and be like, Bonnie Kate, too fast. What did you do? Um, so, as you can see in here, we have woman sitting, she's a frame. And then in this frame, we have a bunch of components. Um, everything is editable except for the shirt base. Uh, that's just the, her torso. Um, so, what you would do is either select here, you can see there I've got, oh, that's the chair. Um, there's her legs, so I could select the legs and then go over to my instance and change skirt long. And then because every component is the exact same size as other related components, it knows to pull it up in the instance. And because I've, you can see it's kind of, it looks a little bit awkward in here. Like things don't necessarily need to be like this frame. This thing is like way out here. But it means that when I change her arm from down, meaning that her arm is facing down to side, it's gonna put it in the right place. Because the, one of the hardest parts about drawing people is consistency. And so if you're drawing, say, a table, if you draw a table a little bit differently, nobody's going to really notice. But people, we spend all day looking at people, looking at ourselves and others. And so even small differences and small mistakes, like I'm sure you've seen bad drawings of hands that are trying to look realistic. And you're like, that's just, you don't know why it's wrong. Or you draw something, you don't know why it's wrong, but you can just feel like it's wrong. Um, it's because we look at it so much. And so this also makes us harsher critics. And so I think a lot of the reason why people don't want to get into illustration or don't want to start drawing is because they've been told, you're not good at drawing, or you're not creative. And no, you are creative. You're here. You're at config, or config. I've been saying it wrong the whole time. <laughs> um, and, but we're told, like, if you can't draw realistically, then you're doing it wrong. And I believe that everybody can draw, and you just need to put pen to paper or mouse to computer. Um, so jumping back in here, if you command click, if, assuming you're on a Mac, um, you'll be able to select those individual pieces of the person. And then I've got a color styles here with just some grays because that's and skin tones because that's more of a square style. Um, but then you can go in and change. So you'll be like, oh, I need to change her arms. Boom. Now we've, we're starting to color this person with actual colors. Um, so I'm hoping you're able to do this if you have your computer with you. No. Nope. Uh, and then Figma's, so Dylan talked about that color selector thing this morning. That's going to be a game changer <laughs> for illustrating, because then all of a sudden, you don't have to be editing things individually. If I want to, oop, that's not a skin tone. Um, if I want to change her from cinnamon to, I've named them after food, cream, it's very easy, and I don't have to select every single thing. Um, so I'm not going to go through every part, because you have the file in front of you. Um, but again, being able to just drag elements in, go over to the asset panel, I could search chair, and then my chairs are going to come up. It looks like hair is also coming up because, uh, <laughs> because it has AIR in it. Um, that's interesting. OK, so then I could go and throw my little chair in. Uh, but yeah, feel free to play with that. I just want to get through this a little bit quickly because you're all smart and you all know Figma. Um, so you can use it. Table mates. So table mates is the tool I've been building for config. Um, basically realize that not everybody wants to make their own composition. And sometimes even the making a composition part seems daunting. And for some illustration styles, so like the square one, very flat, pretty easy to realize where things go, what makes logical sense. Once you start having perspective and more complex shapes and more realistic looking things, it gets harder. Um, and as a brand, you may not want every, because again, there's big range, you may not want every designer making their own illustrated um, uh, compositions. But we still want you to be able to compose illustrations. So the way that this tool works, so this, this on the left was, I made this in, at lunch break because I was inspired by um, the two speakers at the end of the keynote. And so I've, here I've drawn them um, and, and their little stage. So there's a config background now. Um, but so what I would do is it's really similar in principle to the other one, except you don't need to move anything. So again, selecting parts, I can go and change top knot to, let's see, headscarf. Boom, all of a sudden she has a headscarf. I can then change the color of that and the hair and literally everything. Um, oop, now it's the same color as your skin. There we go. Uh, so every, literally everything is editable. You can make it as crazy as you want. And then there's things like food. So food is great. And we, it's, it's kind of hard to draw because a lot of it's blobs. Like realistically, food is a bunch of blobs. So what you can do here as well, oop, my, I don't always do the drag in. I do a lot of just pop it in from the, uh, from the instance panel. So I can add in my spaghetti. I can move it below the lights. If you look at how this is structured, 
We have playground, which is where I've got these two examples. Human, um, which has all the different heads. So I don't know if some of you saw on Twitter, I was trying to get y'all to participate, which a lot of you did. Yes, that guy did. <laughs> um, I, where I was asking you to you know, retweet so I could see what your face looks like. And then I got to add some hairstyles and noses and things. So we developed a much more diverse group of hairstyles by doing that because I don't necessarily have the greatest grasp of what every human being in the world looks like. And finding that cross section is really hard. But by asking people to contribute, which is in a way being open source, it allowed me to see beyond my own bias um, and to put in things that I maybe would have thought are maybe like, oh, long hair, that's kind of generic. It's not that exciting. But actually, there are a lot of people who look like that, and I should have it. Um, things like glasses, realizing that like circles and ovals, we should probably have both, because somebody with circular glasses does not want to be drawn with oval glasses, because they're different. Um, different kinds of eyes, mouths, beards. So all of these are swappable. And then hands. So hands is always a bit tricky. Um, I wanted to be able to include different kinds of utensils. So the utensils are actually swappable. So you can swap the utensil that they're holding. Because again, talking about diversity, when we talk about diversity, we think a lot of the time it immediately goes to skin tone. But culture is a huge part of diversity. And so if I'm illustrating something about food and I don't show chopsticks, which is used by a very large percentage of the population on the planet, I'm not really doing my due diligence as a person who's trying to celebrate diversity. Um, so adding chopsticks is incredibly important, even though I had to keep looking at pictures and then have my boyfriend do this and hold some chopsticks and try to figure it out. Because um, it turns out it's hard to draw. <laughs> um, so we have things on the table, drinks. I have some miscellaneous items that just ended up trying to draw and see how it would go. And then scenes, so we have a light source, which in the, um, in the playground is going to be locked just because it tends to cover most of the image. So it's hard to change things once you have this gigantic light on top of everything. So I lock it. And then some backgrounds, which again, you can change. So we've got our config special background. Um, so you can pretend you were on the keynote stage. And no one will know that you weren't. Um, we've got some plants. We've got a slightly different look of plants. And so the idea would be that you would continue to build this out, dogs. Um, and so then we ended up making all these samples from everybody on Twitter who contributed. There, it turns out there were many more retweets than I could draw. Um, but oh, I can see Lily in there. Hi, Lily. Lily's here. Lily is helping me today. When you have questions about product design that are a little bit outside my realm of knowledge, Lily works with me at OpenTable, and she's going to answer them. Um, so here, there she is in my file with me. Um, so yeah, these were all the examples. So I'm going to let you guys keep playing with that. Um, if you have questions, again, raise your hand. But I know that everyone's pretty interested in how do you build an illustration library? Because yes, I saw that one of these. Yes, that's what you're here for. That's why you stood in a line. <laughs> OK, so building your library step by step. Um, again, this is a framework. So you should cater this to your team's assets and skills. If you have a full-time illustrator, you might be doing things differently. If you have no illustrator at all, might be different than having a full-time person. Um, if you are as enormous as Facebook and Google, it's probably going to be more complicated than this. Um, but this is a framework to help you begin to think about how you might organize that library. And it is five steps. Um, audit, design, organize, produce, and socialize. So audit. So the first step of auditing is to audit the illustrations you already have. So if you don't have any illustrations, guess what? You don't need to do this step very much. Uh, but if you do have some, which most places have at least something, even if it's iconography and you want to include that, um, you want to establish a list of what you currently have. Because a lot of the time, what you'll realize is there's stuff from five years ago hiding in a folder somewhere, and you don't know where it is. Um, you want to just get what you have and create a list, and then gather all of your illustrations into one file for sorting. I like to do that in Figma, because I can zip things around, and I can see it in one big file. Um, and then I would sort by usability. So again, if you have things from five years ago, are they still relevant? Um, I would just sort into like, we might use this, or we're not going to use this. Um, and then assess what tools you're, you're going to need. So if you are doing a more uh, watercolory style, perhaps you do need Photoshop. And then you want to make sure that you establish that upfront, what kind of tools are you going to be working in? Because when you hire your illustrator, or if your illustrator, you know, if they don't exist yet, you want to know what kind of a person you're going to need to be able to execute what tools they're going to need. Um, after auditing everything, I would identify key messages. So once you want to start building that library, sometimes it can feel difficult of like, where do I start? What things should I illustrate? Um, and so what I would start by examining is, are what are your key products and features? 
Again, this is pretty tech oriented um, because a lot of the time, like I went to, I came to OpenTable and realized we don't have an illustration that symbolizes the app. It's like, well, we should probably have one for that. Um, it's what makes our money. Um, so it's important to have those things illustrated because mostly folks from marketing, but also folks in product are going to need them time and time again. Um, company values and principles. This seems to be pretty trending pretty heavily in design right now, where you might have design values and principles, but also company values. It's great to have illustrations of those. Your internal teams are going to be super appreciative that you illustrated your, um, your company's values. And then value props, which that would probably be third on my list. Like You probably want to do it, but um, after the others, probably. And then audiences. And I think this is something we forget about uh, with illustration, and that is figure out who needs to access these files. It might be that they need all of them or just some of them, but you want to think about you know, your marketing folks, product folks. I'm talking about this from a brand perspective, if your brand team were creating this, but it might be the product team. Um, or you know, Do you have a B2B audience and a B2C audience? Internal, again, we often forget about our internal friends, and they love to put drawings on slides. I know this because I used to be an internal brand designer, and I love to put drawings on slides. Um, third party, so if you need to provide something to an agency, like Figma, I believe worked with an agency to create this beautiful event, I'm sure that they needed to provide a bunch of assets to that agency. Wouldn't it be great if they already had a plan for that? Um, and then international, so again, kind of talking about, I talked about the Japanese example before, but thinking about your international partners, they want the assets just as much as your, again, I'm assuming American main company needs, um, but we often forget that we need to tell them where things are. Um, and so just at the bottom, I've got who's involved, and that's who I would start to get involved when you're beginning this process, and that's going to change throughout this. Just checking how I'm doing on time. Doing okay. Okay, design. Uh, so this is the part where the drawing begins. So you can see I've added Illustrator down there at the bottom. Um, so you want to determine your illustration principles, and that does mean aesthetics, but it's a lot more than just aesthetics. You want to determine you know, expressiveness. How do we create narrative? How fun are our illustrations? You know, how appropriate is fun? Um, and then inclusivity, that should always be one of your principles, that being inclusive is a principle of our illustrations in the first place. Um, creating consistent size profiles, uh, because otherwise your illustrator doesn't know what size to build things, and they might build something the wrong size, and they don't know. So if you have consistent size profiles, it's much easier. And then all of the illustrative atoms. So I'm just going to jump to the next slide for that, which are the components of a system. So when we start creating a system, or if you're rebranding your illustration system or tweaking, you want to think about what's my color palette. Maybe that's the same as your product palette. Maybe it's slightly different. Often brand has a slightly different palette than product. Um, they should include skin tones. Uh, a lot of the time brands do not have, you know, browns, creams, tans in their color palette. But this is the time for you to establish, right, what kind of skin tones do we need? Let's make sure we have a range because otherwise your illustrator is not going to use them because you're going to have given them a bunch of colors. They're not going to see it. And unless they are thinking diversity first, they're probably not going to do it because you didn't ask them to. Um, characters. And so that's the people who populate your world. And that can be thought of even more specifically as like, we have specific customers that behave in this way and we want to represent that kind of a person. Um, like our restaurateur or versus our diner. And then we have many kinds of diner or many kinds of restaurateur. Um, objects, says it all there. Um, textures, so that's going to be, you know, is it flat? Does it have a speckly effect? Is it all watercolor? Does it have lines? Um, is it how translucent are things? Do we have gradients? And then holding shapes. So I love Figma's got all these funky holding shapes to put things in. And this is something I think we take for granted a lot. We put things in rectangles and circles and basically call it a day. Um, <laughs> But we can put them in more fun shapes, and that's something to consider up front, because asking an illustrator to do that after. People ask me a lot, can you take this rectangle you've made and put it into a circle? And I'm like, yes, if I redraw everything, because I made you a composition. <laughs> and then devices. So again, if you're working in tech, rather than having a realistic looking iPhone, you could draw an iPhone. Maybe realistic iPhone is what you want, but that can be part of your illustrated system. And if you think about that up front, it's going to make things feel friendlier. And so just a couple of terms. When I say hero illustration, what I mean is a larger illustration that introduces a broad topic. When I say spot illustration, I mean a specific illustration, or sorry, an illustration that speaks to a specific point. Organize, step three. Uh, organize is a, is a fun step where your design system seems to be like, we got this. And a lot of you, I think, are in design systems, so you're like, oh yeah, I'm familiar with some of this casing. Um, so naming and tagging, file names. A lot of the time, your illustrator is going to send you something with probably a random file name like cake. And cake is very hard to find later. 
um, or birthday cake is you know, slightly better, but if you don't have a way of naming your files, it's gonna be really hard to find them later. Um, you also wanna think about casing. I personally prefer sentence case. Some people want tile case. There's something called camel case I just discovered. I'm sure you developer people are like, camel case. Yeah, whatever. Um, but yeah, so casing is important to keep it consistent. It makes it easier for your, I'm, I've been told your engineering system, um, teams to later figure out what you're doing and make it match up. And then ID number, so my new friend John Kerwin uh, told me that all of their illustrations have an ID number. And so that ID number maps to a spreadsheet and then every illustration is always linked to that quite long ID number so that their developers can be just given that number rather than having a name that maybe people are accidentally changing, but no one's gonna ever change a giant string of numbers where somebody might change the birthday cake at the beginning of the file name, but that nobody wants to change a big string of numbers. Um, and then tagging logic. If it's a birthday cake, you might wanna put, and it's called birthday cake ID number, you might also want the word celebration in your tagging or kids or whatever it is that also represents that because I'm sure that you've seen a light bulb illustration that's called idea. And it's not an idea, it's a light bulb, but people are gonna search for the word idea. So you want to tag things with what they are associated with as well as what they actually are because everybody's different and our brains work differently and we search for things differently. And so Figma, Figma number one, um, they have all the beautiful tagging built in. Um, and so I would take advantage of that. Project management is the next step. So you wanna define an illustration brief so that when you give your illustration brief to your illustrator, they are comfortable with what you're asking of them and they know exactly what to give you back. It also means that you're hire a person who's asking for you to ask them to make an illustration if it's not you asking them directly. Everything is always consistent. And I think we skip this part a lot of the time, um, but just creating that brief, it can be a Google Doc. Um, makes it a lot easier for the illustrator, like me, to know exactly what you want and not have to come back to you with questions. Um, I would define a request flow, so that's more for like your PMMs or your um, PMs, so that they know exactly what the process is. And then identify all stakeholders, because a lot of the time, you will get someone to draw something, it will come back, and then the person who asked it will have told you, oh, actually, Jen needs to look at it, and Jen wasn't involved at all in the process previously, and now all of a sudden things are changing. So if you do that early, it makes it much easier to not have to change later, like pretty much all projects. Um, and then clarify tooling. So print restrictions, that is its own world. You wanna make sure that if you need to have print work, that you're taking into account how you're gonna do that. Determine where your masters live, so that's gonna depend on what kind of files they are. Um, but do they live in Google Drive and then they also live in Figma? Do they only live in Figma? That can get complicated. And so you could consider a DAM, so a digital asset management system, um, is I believe what that stands for. And so maybe everything lives in there and then people can access that more easily because going into Google Drive is terrible for looking at a bunch of illustrations that are really like this big. All right, I'm zipping through. <laughs> okay, so how would I organize my files? Uh, into two, essentially. So icons in file one, illustrations in file two. If you have 10,000 icons, like Booking does, as I've been told from the Booking team, you might need more files. Um, but ideally, you don't have 10,000 icons, and they will fit into one file. And the reason I would separate them into those two files is because a lot of the time, people want to turn icons on and illustrations off. Um, if you put them all in one file, people have a lot of extra illustrations they're probably not working with most of the time, but almost everyone needs icons on all the time. Um, similarly, this slide is also showing if you have a core concept, in this case it's delivery, so this was made for caviar, um, and then I've tweaked some things <laughs> for this presentation, um, your system icon that represents delivery should be the same concept as your marketing icon, as your spot illustration, as your hero, so that when the user sees the little icon that represents delivery, they know that when they see a spot illustration on your marketing site, ah, that's still delivery, and they can make these connections really quickly. Um, a note on icons, I am super, super into icons. Um, I believe that Icons should represent concepts, not UI, because UI will change. Um, and so it can take a lot of time to figure out how do we, I was doing this with Lily literally the other day, we were trying to represent a partner network. And so we were drawing like networks and stuff and then realized actually it's about being on someone's radar. And so we drew a, like a, a literally a radar, like a satellite dish. And that makes a lot more sense. And then when we have to scale that up, to a hero, if we had done a network, it's not that interesting, and network is you know, not, not a very pretty concept, but a satellite dish is interesting, and then that icon is very specific, and it doesn't show a UI that we might change in a year. Okay, step four. We're getting there, folks. <laughs> Produce. So, illustration library. That is gonna be a lot of the work. Um, 
you can, this, there's a lot of ways to organize these. In this, I would probably put reference images, which are hopefully pings, because smaller, but you can have transparency. Um, usage rules, so when I say usage, um, a lot of the time we create illustrations that are sp for specific things. So like all the delivery stuff, we want to use that to only mean delivery. We don't want it to mean like speed or fast or something like that. Um, so you want to be able to detail in your illustration library, what is this used for? Because a lot of the time, people will go in there and just grab stuff. Um, and you can't be there to tell them, oh, no, don't use that, please. Um, we want to tell them, this is what this is made for. If you need something for something else, contact me, which I'm going to get to and how we do that in the final step. Um, but if you create rules around how we use different things, it makes it a lot easier for people to follow your system um, and to work with you. And then exporting instructions, especially as we move into the world of Figma, where people are exporting things who perhaps never worked on the file ever. If you put instructions literally typed in there, kind of like I did in my paper dolls file, um, it's much easier for folks to be able to know what they are taking out. Whew, OK, time. Um, <laughs> files. So these are just the files you're probably going to need. Masters in some editable form. Flat files, either pings or JPEGs, because nobody wants to have a Slack message that says, can you please send me that AI as a PNG? You want to be able to just send them the PNG without having to go back into Illustrator. Um, and then references in your DAM, which might be the same as your flat files. Documentation. So detail that file system so that when you leave the company to go on to your next amazing adventure, someone else knows how you built it. Because <laughs> you're going to make something beautiful and perfect, but someone else is going to come in and it won't be as clear to them and you will want it documented. Um, you can create SLAs around delivery for new illustrations. So when someone says, how long does it take to make an illustration? If you don't have an agreement of how long it takes, they, they don't have any way to know how long it actually does take. Because for me, like yes, I can make an icon in 20 minutes, but I may not have 20 minutes right now. So if you create an SLA, it's much easier to go, you can get an icon in a week or a hero in a month. And then when you deliver it early, they're super happy. Um, and then create a hub for helpful links. So that's kind of part of the file um, detailing. So where do all these things live? And then socialize. 10 minutes. Oh, 10 whole minutes? That's amazing. I thought I had way less time. Eight minutes, OK. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Darren from Figma. Um, OK, so socialize. This is a step that I think we forget a lot of the time, because we do all the beautiful work, we make things, we document, and then we don't tell anybody. Uh, so having an illustration brand guide, that might be part of your brand guide. It might be separate. It depends how big of a file you want and how you're kind of organized internally. Um, but that can detail how the style relates back to the larger brand. So why did you make the aesthetic choices you did? How does it relate back to your mission? How does it relate back to your principles of your company? Um, create practical guidelines like we, it's stroke, it's charcoal, it's two pixels, no other things. Uh, it's much easier than hoping people will check and figure it out. Just detail things that are concrete. Um, layout use cases, so again, that goes back to explaining how do, we, how do we use this, how do we not use that, and then include a link to your library in that brand guide. Um, the next thing I would do is set up a weekly illustration sync. So once you've done all this setting up, um, that's probably going to be someone from design ops, probably someone from brand, maybe your illustrator is involved in this, maybe they're not if they're a contractor, um, but I would ask three things in that meeting, every meeting, which could be weekly, bi-weekly, depending on how much work you have. What's coming down the pipeline? So what have people asked me to do? What are our active projects? So what am I currently working on? And what have we shipped since last time? And that one is the one that we forget a lot. Things get made. Maybe they get used. Like I make a thing, I give it to Lily. And then I forget to tell the rest of my team that I made a thing that someone else really needs in the future. Um, so it's important to tell people, what have you shipped? And then for, to put it back into the library and to put it back um, into the documentation. And then talk to your audiences. And this is something I'm very passionate about, I think you should create Slack channels. Illustration Slack channel, or illustration help Slack channel, so that people know where to go. Um, because otherwise, how are they going to ask you questions? And a lot of the time, you have people who are remote. You have people in other offices. They can't just come to your desk. They may not know you. You might be brand new at your company, and you just made an awesome thing. Um, you can offer office hours for people who are um, in your office, or they can attend digitally. We do this at OpenTable, and I find it really helpful for people to be able to just come to my desk, and I have an hour twice a week, and we work on smaller things, and we take in requests um, that are going to be smaller. And it's much easier for people than having to sometimes submit a request, but then it turns out it wasn't quite right. They could just come talk to you. And it's nice to have that time set aside. And then the last one, which not scary for me because I am a performer by nature, but for some people, they don't like this, uh, showcase work at team or company meetings. So 
we want to be proud of the work we make and we should show it to the people who work on our team and the teams adjacent to ours and to the whole company. Um, I think that design, like products get a lot of time in the spotlight, but brand doesn't necessarily because it's supposed to feel kind of invisible in a way. It's supposed to be like, it's just there all the time. It's where you're working, it's there. But if you're showing what brand is really bringing and what illustration is bringing, it can be a powerful storyteller that helps express the values and personality of your brand. Get in contact with me. But yeah, so now we have, it sounds like we have maybe five minutes. Yep, he's nodding at me. We have five minutes for open discussion. So if you have questions, yes, I love it. There's a hand. And I'm going to be here at the party. I'll be, at the, I'll be here as long as that let me be here. So you can also ask questions uh, if you have more later. Hi, Bonnie. That was really awesome. Um, this is poignant to me because when I was going to art school, I was a hostess using Open Table. <laughs> so awesome. Um, I'm just wondering if you ever deliver your assets as SVGs. And if you have any wisdom around that, and if you've ever you know, discussed with your developers how they're actually processing that final SVG, wondering if you have any wisdom about that. Uh, yes. So this is going to be more from an icon side. When I was at Square, I was very lucky that we had developers in-house I was working directly with. Um, and what we were able to do, when we first we'd make icons, I'd make them in Illustrator, then we'd export individual SVGs, then I would go clean them up in a program, I've now forgotten what it's called, and it was hard, like thousands, not thousands, sorry, hundreds, hundreds of these, and then give it to my developer, and then the developer would say, oh, part of this broke, and we'd have to redo it. What we ended up doing, and this is by just being, that like constant syncing with people, um, was we used Figma's, a, a, a Figma API, um, I believe is how this works, to take the icons directly from Figma and put them into the, um, I, I want to say code base. I don't know if that's right, because I don't, I don't work very much with developers. Um, but we do have to provide a lot of SVGs. And so cleanliness of your files is super, super helpful for that. Um, it's like one of the issues with Illustrator is like people leave open paths. And that sometimes doesn't render correctly. And when you copy paste it into Figma, it sure doesn't render correctly. So um, part of it is making sure your files are really clean, not having any extra layers and things hiding around. Um, I can plug Time Machine. So Time Machine is a Figma plugin that, if you haven't tried it, Time Machine. It's great. You right-click something, it puts it on a page um, that it auto-generates with the date in a frame, and then you can delete whatever it was that you just put in the Time Machine. And this means that I don't have to worry about deleting that hidden layer that I might want to take back later some, no. You just put it in the Time Machine. You don't need it anymore. So that helps a lot with file cleanliness for me. Um, and then naming, it turned out to be the other thing with the developers that was really tricky because having everything have the correct name, it turns out, is surprisingly hard. And creating a naming system is actually very difficult. Um, so those were a couple of things that I found have been helpful. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Darren's walking with the mic. Oh, no, he's just walking over there. Any other questions? I have, You're going to talk to me later. I either, oh, there we go. Lily has a, thank you, Lily. I was like, either I was very, I covered everything, or you're like, nope, that wasn't for me. <laughs> you know, I have a question. Obviously, you know, we, we work together, but um, more of like a higher level question. You know, you talk about people who are not like illustrators by trade being able to do this kind of work. What sort of mechanisms would you recommend putting in place for people who just, you, you give them the style guide, you say, here, run with it, but then they want to add something else to the library. Yeah. Um, how, would, how would you have that function or work? Yes, that's a great question. So um, when people want to add things to the library or to your style guide, they want to essentially improve and add to your uh, illustrations, that is when talking to people is like the most important thing. Um, and I would come up with an approval process. So I kind of wish I had that in there now. I'm probably going to add it now. Um, but having a system where someone can submit something. So we did this at Square a little bit where someone else might draw an icon and then give it to me because I managed all of our icons. And then I could go through and make all the tweaks I might see because I want it to be super perfect. And, but I don't necessarily need to draw the rubber duck in the first place to know we need a rubber duck. Someone else could do the rubber duck. Um, and then I can add that. So it's nice to have this kind of dual layer of I'm then reviewing it and then putting it into the library. Um, and that way people can still create things without necessarily being that's the final end all be all. 
I imagine that's the end of, of the time, because I bet that took a minute. Yeah, sorry, we are out of time. Thanks Thank so much, Bonnie. Thank you, everyone.